And it's time probably to ask Dr. Geshwind in regard to local therapies. Uh, the field of local therapy is evolving and mushrooming uh, with different technologies. And obviously, it's very confusing for a medical oncologist what are those different technologies. So please walk us through what stays with chemo embolization, what's bland embolization, and then we'll tackle others. But let's yeah. start with those. I, I think we have to start with the scientific rationale. And, and the scientific rationale is based on the notion that liver tumors, whether they rise in the liver or metastasize to the liver, draw their blood supply from the hepatic artery. Mm -hmm. So that means we can actually exploit that to our benefit and to obviously the patient's benefit because we can use it as a roadway to get to the tumor and deliver chemicals, radioactive components directly to where it hurts the most, which is the tumor itself. And in doing so, we are preserving obviously the systemic uh, organs, but we're also preserving a lot of the normal liver tissue. And the whole concept here is that uh, the Japanese discovered more than 30 years ago that if you are suspending chemotherapy into an oily medium called lapidol, you can actually create an emulsion that uh, sticks to the tumor cells. And so you are really altering the pharmacokinetic profile of these uh, commonly used chemotherapeutic agents uh, to the benefit of uh, the, kill, the tumor kill. So these uh, uh, drugs will actually stay confined within the tumor bed for a long period of time uh, and kill the tumors and recreating essentially in vitro condition in an in vivo system. And, and that is the concept of chemoembolotherapy. So chemoembolization, there are two types, conventional and drug eluding beads. Mm -hmm. The conventional type is this lipidol chemotherapy emulsification process, followed by some degree of embolization, meaning little beads that we use to kind of slow down the blood flow. The, the, again, the arterial inflow. So we can preserve the sanctity of the emulsion. It's very important to keep this emulsion intact as long as we can so that the drugs have time to stay within the tumor and exert their effect. And the drug eluding bead concept is that instead of being a sort of cooking recipe, uh, because mixing oil and chemo is the same as creating a mayonnaise or vinaigrette when you cook at home, instead of doing it uh, very crudely, uh, the concept was uh, why not have polymer-based microspheres that can elude out uh, the drugs over a long period of time. And uh, the results, again, are equivocal, but uh, the fact is that those are the two uh, types of chemoembolotherapy. And then the third one that you mentioned is bland embolization, where there you are basically trying to cut off the blood supply, but distally, close to the tumor, not like a surgical ligation, very proximally far away from where the tumor is so that the, the blood vessels can form around that occlusive uh, device. There, it's very close to the tum where the tumor is, to the nidus of the tumor, so you can actually really cause a massive ischemic insult that will result in tumor death. That's, that's fascinating, and uh, the data, just kind of like uh, reiterate, is based mainly on two studies uh, in regard to chemobilization by Lové and Lowe that showed that actually disease-free survival uh, 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 variable within three years has been definitely better than if patients were in post-supportive care. I think in regard to bland embolization, there was data from our group by Karen Brown lately that showed no difference uh, between chemo and bland embolization, even though this is within the limitation of a single institution study, but at least bring a little bit of the evolution of that uh, therapeutic intervention altogether. And I think it again bring the concepts of that multidisciplinary discussion that we do in regard to the choices of therapy. But tell us about what's radioembolization now. So radioembolization is using the same concept, which is, again, using the artery as a conduit to the tumor. And instead of delivering a payload of, uh, based in chemotherapy, it's now radiation. Uh, it's yttrium 90 with a fairly short half-life of about 64 hours. Uh, and the key here, again, is localized delivery and preservation of the uh, normal, healthy liver tissue, which is so critical, as we know, because the patients are mostly cirrhotics. Uh, so the concept is uh, for a maximized uh, effect of radiation uh, delivered to the tumor. Uh, and there are really two types of devices that we have been using, one from Australia, one from Canada. The difference is really in the activity per bead. So the amount of radioactivity that is delivered directly to the tumor. The product from Canada having a very high activity per bead, so you need less microspheres to exert a radioactive effect. The one from Australia, 
is less so, so you need more beads, and as a result of more beads, it is presumed that you're gonna have a greater embolic effect, but it's really hard to prove or disprove. But that is the concept of radioembolization. In the context of HCC, it really hasn't been shown in any uh, convincing way that it is superior to chemoembolization, but there is a niche application in some cases for radioembolization. Which is? Mostly patients with portal vein invasion, and the main reason for that is because initially when chemoembolization was conceived, uh, there was a fear that you would go to stasis of the hepatic artery, and if the portal vein was already shut down, you would have complete infarction of that area that you treated with chemoembolization. So the concept was because radioembolization is so, the beads are so small, they are about 30 microns in size, they do not cause any kind of embolization effect. So you are preserving the arterial inflow and you are not running any kind of uh, causing a chance of infarction in the liver. But Jeff, you know, so this is something that becomes very relevant at tumor boards because we're talking about what by the Barcelona staging system would be intermediate, right? And, and to go back to the earlier discussion about staging patients taking into consideration their underlying liver disease, the extent of tumor burden. And if we're talking about chemoembolization for a group of patients which we consider Barcelona B, which are intermediate, they have a good performance status, generally performance status zero, uh, the tumor is confined to the liver, often it's multifocal because of that field defect. But who, who with that characteristic should not undergo local regional therapy? And, it, and you commented on vascular invasion as a safety issue, but isn't it also an efficacy issue? I mean, quoting the studies that, that Kassan mentioned that date back to establishing taste as a standard of care really excluded patients who had vascular invasion. You know, the, the criteria for patient selection was pretty strict as far as size, tumor burden, and this vascular issue. And, and while, you, while you speak to radioembolization as potentially a, something that favors Y90 over taste because of safety, let's talk about how well they work in those ways. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a very good point. I mean, the, the, you know, the first thing to say is that those studies were small because I think we all agree the nature of HCC clinical trials uh, dictates it. It's very difficult to enroll uh, large, patient, uh, large amounts of patients in HCC trials, okay? So uh, we could argue about the numbers, but the fact is that it was unequivocal, and these two studies, randomized phase three trials, established uh, chemoembolization because there was a survival benefit. That was very clear. Now, that's basically- A benefit in the population defined- But this studies. is my point. That those two studies, in particular the Barcelona one, is what helped establish the BCLC criteria. Let's not forget, Correct. okay? So they established the utility of chemoembolization and they found that the patients who benefited most were those patients who did not have portal vein invasion, who had performance status of zero, ECOG zero, and were essentially the best potential patients to receive chemoembolization. That's 40% of the patients with HCC globally, worldwide. Now, Gassan did not ask me a philosophical assessment of whether radioembolization should be used. Exactly, it's coming later, I know. He asked me about the rationale and is, what is radioembolization. I explained it. doesn't mean I endorse it. However, I have to say that for patients who present with limited advanced stage liver cancer, Let's meaning define a, that. I will the, define you know, it for yeah. you. If you let me, I will define it. Okay, I'm used By to the way, we're, we're having a live broadcast from a tumor board. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> exactly. It was an invisible patient. Um, but the fact of the matter is that if you look at the early stage BCLCC patients, the patients who have uh, a fairly well-preserved liver function, who have ECOG zero, O1, and have branch portal vein invasion in a limited scope, those patients do very well with local regional therapy. It's been shown in many studies. Unfortunately, none of them were randomized, but many case series, uh, uh, level two data, phase two studies that have shown unequivocally the survival benefit of chemoembolization and radioembolization. Versus? With, well, we, that's what I said. We don't have a comparative arm because they were not randomized. However, we do know from the seraphine, from the SHARP data and Asia Pacific data, which we'll go over, that we know what to expect. We know what the survival expectancy is of a patient with child with a BCLCC. 
And when you see that, again, through multiple data, multiple studies that have been published, you achieve 12, 14, sometimes 16 months median survival in patients with advanced stage liver cancer, you have to take that into consideration. So let me summarize what's going on here because that's very important. <laughs> so uh, we heard about transarterial chemobilization, we heard about transarterial bland embolization, we heard about uh, radioembolization, and in reality, uh, the data is limited. Uh, we have two randomized trials that were happened that happened probably about 15 to 16 years ago, yeah. exactly. And uh, in addition to that, uh, after this, there was so much comfort and so much confidence in regard to those therapies. There are trials that, that look about safety. There's a little bit of less available data on efficacy, as Richard mentioned. And I have to say that the expanded uh, kind of comfort zone in regard to whom to embolize and whom to probably do radio embolization with would differ, and sometimes a little bit more generous, sometimes a little bit less generous. If anything, the message is we cannot give any guidance in that regard because truly there are differences in opinion, and frankly, they're all respected. But nonetheless, it again reiterates the need for multidisciplinary approach. I would like to quote here a very important study by Hashim al Sarag, a very well known hepatologist, in regard to the use of the different disciplines in the care of a patient. And it was noted that patients who have seen a surgeon like Adam, an interventional radiologist like Jeff, and a hepatologist like uh, Richard, uh, sorry, like Bob, and a oncologist like Richard, these are the ones who survive the longest. And this just tells you because you can't talk to one patient with one therapy and not really study it from every perspective per se. With this.